Affairs Committee uh, into session. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Senator Hatchett. Senator Hatchett, would you mind opening us with prayer? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Please speak to us today as we hear uh, these pieces of legislation and let us make the right choices for the people of the state of Georgia. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Here. First on the docket, we have uh, Senate Bill 34. Senator Parent, uh, the floor is yours. If you don't mind, uh, what is that, uh, number one? Try that. Hello, hello. Sounds on. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Distinguished Agriculture and Consumer Affairs Committee. Um, we had a hearing on this piece of legislation that came out of a study committee that we did over the summer, or actually in the fall, um, last week. And um, we have made a couple changes. It's, the, the bill is substantially the same as, as what you heard. Um, two changes. I had a conversation, it, I'm looking at page um, three, line 60. This is where the uh, enforcement provisions begin and we had had in there that an aggrieved food service establishment could bring um, action for violation of the code section, which is still there. We had also had in there that the attorney general could do so sort of on behalf of the of the consumer, but in further conversation with the Office of the Attorney General, um, it seemed to me that that was not necessary because they already have some existing laws that they could use, A, and, and B, there were some complications in there. Uh, if, if the Attorney General is bringing an action, then you sort of need to make sure that some of the relief could go to taxpayers as opposed to a private entity like the, a private food service establishment. So that was going to take some more parsing, and upon reflection, I decided, but of course this is in front of your committee, that the, that the actions that could be brought by aggrieved food service establishments should, should be sufficient to provide an enforcement mechanism for the check. Then the other change is um, on the last page in um, subparagraph Three. It used to use the term, um, I'm looking at line 80, that there could be an affirmative defense if the third party delivery service shows that it use, uses um, an affirmative defense if, they're, if they have been using due diligence and established substantial processes, including but not limiting to establishing and confirming receipt of standards. That used to say policies. I made it standards upon the request of some of our third-party app uh, delivery services. They preferred the term standards for the way they operate their business versus policy. So I made that change. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Those are the changes. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the members of the committee? Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is only uh, prepared food, right? It doesn't include That's groceries right. or anything else people are hauling around in their cars. That's exactly right. Yes, the definitions, um, ready to eat food, but it's not just that. It's from a food service. Food service establishment. Okay is the way we define food service establishment excludes grocery stores and the like. So like this is not the Instacarts of the world. This is really just your sort of carry out third party um, food app. Do they businesses. have the, any of the same rules, regulations guarding them or does it, do you know by chance? I'm just so, curious. I hope I'm not wrong in saying this. I don't think that they do, and they certainly don't on their ready-to-eat prepared foods. The scope of our study committee was more dealing with the restaurant and third-party app um, relationship and that business. Gotcha. So we did not get into, nor do I want 
nor did I want to take on in that sub study committee or right now Instacarts, et cetera, because we have not, we did not study that issue. Yeah, so I'm not prepared to make re recommendations about if you were saying, I want my Instacart delivery driver to bring me like a rotisserie chicken. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I know it's important because I mean, at the farm level, we have to do a lot of food safety. And then there's a lot of things that happen between the farm and it getting to the grocery store shelf. And we become liable for all those things in between. And I can see the same thing happening for a restaurant person that they, it leaves their restaurant, it's safe and it's clean, but it could, something could happen along the way. So good bill. All right. Thank you, Senator Watson. Uh, now we have uh, Senator Hatchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on line 47 and 48, it talks about using appropriate containers. Yes. Are th the burden to purchase those containers, is that going to be put on the driver or is that for the delivery service to supply to the drivers? So they do it differently now. Um, DoorDash, I believe, once they, want, according to their website and materials, once you have completed your first delivery as a dasher you get a welcome kit and that includes some temperature control bags um the bill is silent as to who has to pay for that that's something the committee could consider but i, I in this particular draft we do not have it laid out who is required to pay for the temperature control bag okay and i have one other question, Mr. Chairman. Um, on line 76, it says, um, third party delivery service shall be liable for any harm or injury caused by failure by such service or its agent, employer, independent contractor to satisfy the requirements provided for in subsection C. The door dash or you know, other third party delivery drivers, are they employees, independent contractors, or agents? They are they are independent contractors so as an independent contractor would the third party delivery service be able to direct and enforce these standards on their drivers or would it be because i know with with independent contractors there's some rules about what you're able to enforce what you're able to i guess require of your drivers those requirements would that still keep them in the realm of independent contractor or would those new requirements cause so them I to be employees. I mean, what you're getting into is the area that has been broached by some of these new technology startup companies, right? Where the individuals driving for them are clearly not any kind of traditional uh, employee, but they're also don't completely fall neatly into independent contractor either. We have classified them under Georgia law as independent contractors. So the issue you raise I think has already been taken care of under Georgia law. Okay. So even though they are, we are requiring them to have these specifications put on their drivers, they're still independent contractors, even though they're directing them to do these things. Yes. I mean, that's how we've defined it under, under Georgia law. If you, you know, it's a very interesting intellectual conversation because they don't really neatly fall into either or, in my opinion, maybe yours either. But, mm. but we've defined them as independent contractors in Georgia law, yes. Sh should that be something we should put in this bill or do you think it's clear I enough? Think it's, so I think that we only did that a year ago or so. Um, it's a bit beyond the scope of this particular bill because it's such a, I mean, honestly, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue, but it, I think some consider it settled under Georgia law. Okay. I, look, you and I should talk about that offline, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's complicated. To me, they don't directly fit either or, but we've classified them as independent contractors. Okay. They're not employees, right? Because they can pick up work when they want. Right. And I'm sorry, I'm having a little extra dialogue here, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess with this, with this bill, the way it's written, an independent, uh, the, the delivery service will be liable for the independent contractor's failure to comply with these directions. So that's this exact reason is why we put in this affirmative defense because it's not realistic to expect under this business model and the way the businesses operate, they don't have boots on the ground. It's not as though they can, they are not employees and the, the drivers are not employees and they cannot be inspecting every vehicle. At the same time, they are holding themselves out as a company that Georgia consumers would do business with under their own, you know, 
logo and um, modus operandi. And I don't think it's too much to expect that they provide guidelines and training for, or you know, guidelines and standards for the individuals that are operating under their name and that they should expect that their drivers, which they do have on their websites, right, abide by those. If they don't, then a platform could cease to do business with that driver. But we have it in here where they could show, hey, look, we've got these policies, we've got these procedures, this has been clearly communicated. So in this instance, we should not be hit with uh, hefty penalties. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm following. Because you try to, you've got to have an enforcement mechanism, but you have to recognize that they cannot be. It doesn't work under the business model, nor or or this uh, this type of tech business. Period. DoorDash, for example, is not inspecting every driver before they leave their house. Nor would I think the General Assembly expect them to. I think that would be unreasonable. But we also think it's reasonable to expect that they have communicated clearly expectations and standards by which they are to operate if they're wearing the DoorDash, just to use one example, mantle. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Senator Anderson. Senator, um, this food is ready to eat, right? Yes, sir. You don't have nowhere in the bill where it says that it's got to be delivered by a certain time. True. That is another issue. So how would you handle that? I believe it's the bill silent to it, as you point out. Um, I believe that some of the apps do try to organize pickups within a certain radius, but there is nothing in law or even in this bill, as it's currently written, that would prohibit a company, if, if they've got a contract with a, or a, a written agreement, which we would require in the bill for the first time, with a restaurant to pick up their food and in, you know, Buckhead and drive it to Stockbridge. We don't, that, the, right now there's no requirement that that would not be permitted or three hours later handed over. And, and nor is it in this bill. Some do try to organize pickups and drop-offs to keep the, the food warm or, or cold, as the case may be. Look, it's in the interest of, of the, the third-party um, delivery company, as well as the driver, as well as um, the restaurant, if they've entered into a written agreement, to not have the food show up after three hours, because clearly that consumer is probably not going to want to do business there's a disincentive. There's an incentive to set up the processes so that everything mostly works. One of the things we're taking a look at though is for example, right now there's no requirement to have a written agreement and there could be an incentive to operate without a written agreement, right? Whereas there's less of an incentive, but I'm not on the committee, right? Um, there's less of an incentive to deliver the food three hours later and have it be not very edible. I guess what I'm trying to say is the customer at a certain time and they say, no, I, ain't, I don't want this. I mean, it, it took you two hours to get here. Right, so in that instance, some, some people will think that they, they're that they are a customer of the restaurant. So they might call the restaurant. They might think they're a company of, a, a customer of Uber Eats to use another company. They might call one or the other. If they call the restaurant, and I, I know we have the Georgia Restaurant Association folks here, so if I'm saying anything wrong, they are the ones who will be more, much more expert it, to it, answer that. But they might say, you, need, you're, you are a customer, you have placed an order with Uber Eats, and you need to phone them if your experience have, did, did not meet expectations. Have I already paid for the meal before? Yes, but then th this gets into some of the chargeback questions that these folks are a little more expert on as to how actually that unfolds. I think that the money can be refunded. At times, restaurants have been in the position of having to refund it when, in, in their testimony, the restaurant didn't actually do anything wrong. But at times, I think the third party will refund the restaurants. But they, they can speak to it better than I, Mr. Chairman. And you know, this, del this delivery radius thing is an issue. We just didn't 
it wasn't something that got included in our final study committee report. Everything in, in the bill came directly out of kind of like what all five of us decided on in the, in the study committee in a bipartisan manner. But. Well, if you're going to. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Just. No, if if you if you don't. It's if up you, to you. You're running. Yeah, if you would, if, if if you don't mind, let's let's finish with our questions with with Senator Parent, and then you can come up and and speak to answer any questions if that's okay. Um, are you done, Senator? Okay. Um, Senator Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Uh, Senator, I understand this came out of a study committee that was specific around um, ready to eat food, but is there a reason why you don't include, uh, say, like Amazon Fresh or these people, places that are delivering food to cook, um, like the groceries? Because I recently received my groceries and they smelled and reeked of smoke, and so I'd like for this to apply to that too. Well, it, it, yeah. I imagine that there are issues related to those businesses as well. The scope of the resolution we put in and, and all the testimony received dealt specifically within the sort of restaurant to third party app relationship. The, uh, that issue as well as some others did crop up, but we never fully explored it or took a lot of testimony on it and therefore none of it made it into the final report. That does not mean that there are not issues or that another senator might want to delve further as part of this bill or another. All righty, do you have anything else that? No, just, um, you know, we, I think, worked hard to find a balance, understanding that, you know, we have a lot of regulations on restaurants and for health, food, and safety, and that, the, and then, then there are no regulations at all once that food and that product has been handed over to the delivery company. We're trying to strike a balance between recognizing that it's, um, in the interests of restaurants, third-party delivery companies, and consumers for, for everyone to work symbiotically, but knowing that it is sort of like a new method, a, bit, a, mo a model of business that we expect to keep growing, that it may behoove us to take a look and um, provide some, some initial oversight into that relationship requiring a written agreement and some basic health and safety regulations. So I've got one question on line 46 where it, where it says uh, tr uh, vehicle used for transportation delivery shall be clean and capable of withstanding frequent cleaning. Mm -hmm. So my question from that is, is not, and I don't, you know, where I live at, Senator Parent, we don't, we don't have DoorDash and Uber and all that kind of stuff, you know, but I mean, you, you're not, <laughs> we, yeah, we have to drive 20 miles to pick up a pizza, but um, they, uh, you're not trying to imply in there that they have to have like vinyl floors and vinyl seats and all that kind of stuff, are no, you? No, but maybe if like you had um, a carpet that was like falling apart and spewing um, fibers in the air, that could be a problem. Okay, I got you. All righty, good deal. Um, would uh, would our friends from the uh, restaurant association? Would you? Uh, yeah, Miss. Yeah, you come on up and answer. You want me to? Or you, want me to you can stay where you're at. That's fine. I'll stay. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, is anybody here from DoorDash? I guess not. Um, the, it is my understanding that the way the app works is it is done geographically. Um, as someone that actually developed the delivery concept back in, in, in uh, the late 90s for a restaurant chain, um, that, that's the biggest issue that drives us. In fact, I stopped our program after six months because I thought that we were bringing a reputation of our brand, and um, which which is an issue for our restaurants. A lot of them, their brand is being ruined without them even knowing that a third-party delivery company is picking it up. Because you're ordering on the app, but if the restaurant, um, it, you're ordering on the app, and if the app is not connected to that restaurant, you have somebody actually calling the restaurant, and they want the order for Jason, and then the food gets delivered um, to the, not gets, excuse me, let me get this straight. They just call and make an order for like Joe Smith, okay? But they're taking it to Jason. Jason gets it, his french fries are eaten, it's cold, the bag has uh, fibers in it and everything. So you call the restaurant, they don't know who you are and why you were calling about this food um, because they didn't do a transaction with you. You did a transaction with the third party. 
<coughs> Does that make sense? Am I explaining that correctly? Yeah. Okay. And can I ask a question as well? Sure. This bill basically right now, in any of these food delivery services, they can they can use a restaurant's name, likeness, or whatever else. Um, this bill is going to make it where a, a restaurant has to uh, consent to for them to be using their service to carry their products. Am I am I not correct that on that? Is, that is correct. That is the purpose of the bill is to create that that tra that uh, contractual relationship so that the restaurant has the choice to either enter into an agreement or not enter into agreement. And somebody cannot take their likeness and their trademark and their intellectual property and put it on their third party app. Senator Burns? Just a clarification. Uh, the restaurant has to, if they choose to utilize a delivery, third party delivery, so isn't that um, an, an implied consent that they said, okay, we're going to use you to deliver our food? Um, I'm just, the, the question I have is. If they're supposed to have a contract. I agree. And again, this bill requires a, a written agreement, which yes. apparently in the past was not no. a, a need or but a requirement. The, the company did a very good job of going around and getting restaurants to sign up on a contract. So they signed a restaurant up, let's say, um, a delivery service, third-party delivery mm -hmm. service. And when they signed up to utilize that delivery service, there was never a, a an agreement with between the restaurant and the delivery service? At that, in the, yes, At that, that is. At that point, there was not? No, there is an actual there is an actual contract that exists. Well, what has been happening is that person decides they don't want to utilize the service anymore, so they tell DoorDash, "I don't want you," and they continue to use their image. The um, third-party deliveries also will take somebody's image and their menu and everything else and put it up on their platform. And we've had instances of them putting restaurants on the platform that say aren't even in business on Sunday. The owner comes into the restaurant on Monday morning and their phone system is blown up with people cussing them out from not delivering their food on Sunday when they're not even open. Right. We've had issues, um, one, one place in, uh, in B. Matthews, um, they keep putting up a Chinese restaurant menu for that restaurant and it's not a Chinese it's restaurant. And we've helped a lot of restaurants um, with uh, our uh, general counsel to write cease and desist letters. Yeah, I've experienced it where I, we, it kept happening with the same restaurant until I finally wised up and it was actually kind of part of learning about this where I was like, oh, now I see what was going on. Mm -hmm. We kept trying to order on the app for, a one, for one restaurant that just was like, we are not doing business. And so nothing would ever come. And then two hours later, we go back on and it says order canceled. Right. And I realized belatedly that it was actually mm -hmm. due to this issue, that there was no agreement between the app I was using Correct. and the restaurant between that they were going to. the third-party delivery service and the restaurant. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any other questions from any member of the committee for either Senator Parent or uh, Ms. Bremer from the Restaurant Association? Okay. What's the, uh, do you have a question? Your, your button's on, I think. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion. I, I believe it is the appropriate time. I make a motion to pass. Okay, who's, who's second it? Okay, Senator Sims. All right, we have a motion to pass by Senator uh, Jackson and a, uh, a second from Senator Sims. Um, all in favor? Signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Thank, thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you all. You. Thank you. All righty, thank you. Thank you. All righty. I know it's uh, the hour is getting late, but uh, save the best for last. Save the best for last. Uh, Senator Harold Jones, thank you. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm operating off um, LC510318. Senate Bill 177, which is the Food and Security Eradication Act. Um, for those who were not here last year, just give a quick background. This comes from a study committee that was done in 2020, 2021, which dealt with food deserts or either what you may also call food swamps. Bottom line is basically it's a food insecurity problem that affects millions of Georgians. And the study committee found that there's various issues that d deal with basically food insecurity. Uh, just give you a couple of 
things that people kind of commonly think of when they talk about food insecurity and how to cure it and why we kind of came up with this particular idea. Um, there are some factions out there that say, you know, one of the reasons, one of the ways to cure food insecurity is let's get rid of all the Dollar Generals, for instance. But when you find out that that really would not be the case, that would not necessarily cure it because the fact of the matter is Dollar Generals, for instance, are basically fulfilling the need that's not being met in a lot of those communities. Um, another one may be, well, if you gave tax credits to grocery stores, then they would be able to build more grocery stores. But the grocery store industry basically only has a 1% profit margin. So even a tax credit would not necessarily mean that grocery stores could go into um, areas that necessarily could actually economically handle that. And so therefore, what we find is that this problem exists across racial lines and across economic lines. Um, it affects Atlanta area, affects Augusta, affects Valdosta, affects persons all over the state. So what we decided to do was, instead of just trying to come up with one quick bill to try to solve this particular issue, let's try to actually develop a food policy council, which we've done in other areas too. And we created this bill last year, and it came through this committee and was able to pass, went through the Senate 52 to nothing. And then in the House, they had a, just a couple of issues and we just kind of ran out of time. So a couple of differences in this bill from last year would be, we actually passed 22 members of the food policy council. That was one of the issues that the House had. So we've narrowed that down now to just 16 members. And then the second aspect of it was, have more persons actually being able to make appointments. We not only had a uh, lieutenant governor, the speaker and the governor making appointments, which this bill has, we also had like the minority leader, majority leader, probably had too many people they felt actually making the appointment. So I corrected that. Other than that, the bill basically reflects what came through this body last year through this particular committee and also through the Senate 52 to nothing. So I'm just asking for your favorable consideration so we can get it back through the Senate and get it to the House and really, I think, have more state buy-in as far as food insecurity is concerned. I think that's how we're gonna be able to kind of solve this issue. All right, do we have any questions for uh, Senator Jones, members of the committee? Oh, we have a loop. Okay, Senator Anderson. Well, I believe it's the proper time. All right, we have a motion to pass from Senator Anderson and a second from Senator Estevez, is it? Okay, okay, he's gonna take it. We have a second from Senator Estevez. All right, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no, passes unanimously. Thank you, all thank right. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you all. This meeting is adjourned. I guess we're supposed to make a motion to adjourn, but. <laughs>